In a little town on the southern shore of the Black Sea, a savior was born. The sky was burning with light. Two comets blazed in the shape of the Persian sh Shamsher. People were amazed. It was finally time a savior king was born, and his name was Mithridates Dionysus. Mithridates V Eurgates, Mithridates VI's father, had brought the Pontic Kingdom under the watch of Rome after he helped them put down the Sun People's Rebellion. The Romans would give Mithridates V Phrygia for helping them. Mithridates at this point had a very energetic lifestyle. At the age of 10, just like Alexander the Great, he tamed a wild horse. The horse bucked and threw, but the brave child held on. Mithridates was in love with racing and physical games. He was determined to beat everyone in these games, and he did just that. It was always Mithridates winning. However, Mithridates' life would change fast. His mother, Queen Laodice, killed his father. Mithridates began to wonder, would I be next? What was my mother planning on doing with me? His paranoia began to rise. He couldn't imagine his own mother killing him. However, there was another figure in his life, and that was Mithridates the Good, his spoiled brother. His mother favored him over Mithridates VI. There wasn't a particular reason for this. Mithridates realized that he may end up like his father if he didn't act swiftly. He first started by sleeping with his Persian-style knife under his pillow, and always carrying it with him. It was at this point that Rome took advantage of Pontus. They took Phrygia from them. The fact that they did this enraged Mithridates. Why would they do such a thing? Phrygia was a gift. Rome was greedy, and doing this basically stated that they would be controlling Pontus. Mithridates was not going to have it. He needed help first, and sought after a few friends. Dorylaus was one. His life was in danger too. He was of royal blood, and his father, Dorylaus the Older, was assassinated like Mithridates' father. Dorylaus was a friend, and could be trusted. There weren't many other people who would join Mithridates, however, this journey was a must. So with ten or so bodyguard, at the dawn of the day, the group traveled out of Sinope and would never return. The group that traveled out of Sinope was a fierce one. Nothing scared them. The boys would compete just like they did at home, racing, wrestling, seeing who could take the most bee stings. Mithridates didn't just dilly-dally around, though. He made friendships and allies. One of these allies were the turret folk, the fiercest of them all. How Mithridates got them to ally with him is unknown, but they would become key in the Third Mithridatic War. Mithridates also began to work on his poisons. Many famous kings have died of poison, he thought. It has to be a must that I can survive it. And let me tell you that, he did just that. He started by taking in small doses of arsenic and his own poisons that he made. He also began to work on his famous Mithridatium. Most of the ingredients are unknown. They have been lost to us over thousands of years. Mithridates in this time also studied commanders like Cyrus and Alexander the Great. In fact, now that we are here, we should talk about this for a minute. Mithridates was related to both these kings and loved their wars and experiences. He had actually inherited Alexander's cloak. How it got all the way from Egypt to Asia is once again unknown, but it is not impossible. Mithridates also read the how Greeks were not allowed to dine with other men until they had killed a boar, something that took Cassander 25 years. Mithridates wanted to face the boar. He would get that chance. As a group of boys chased the boar, it ran into a corner. Mithridates has his chance. If he misses the boar, it will rush forward and kill the boys and their dogs. Mithridates jabs and kills the boar. The boys dine like kings that night. Mithridates was not afraid of any animal or person. During this time, many beasts like bears and lions challenged Mithridates. All fell before the king. Many military-related talks would have gone on too, like what was the best fire repellent? All the boys agreed it was alum. Eventually, after an unknown time period, the group began their journey home. Mithridates talked to many garrison troops and assured them that he would become their leader. Of Pontus, the garrison troops were elated. Finally, they thought, it's time we get Laodicea out of here. Mithridates up high on a mountain could see Laodicea, his mother's castle. Mithridates laughed. My mother built her castle for beauty, not for defense. He was right, the castle was in a bad place. Mithridates continued his way to Sinope, and as he burst into the castle, everyone froze. Laodicea ordered the troops to arrest Mithridates. However, they weren't budging. It dawned on her, these weren't her troops anymore. Mithridates ordered the troops to arrest Laodicea, and that they did. Eventually, everyone who helped her was killed, including his spoiled brother. Mithridates began to take into account of this situation. He realized that the army was nothing it once was. It dwindled under his mother's command. Mithridates started to rebuild it. 
he recruited 6,000 Greek hoplites, a little over Roman legion. Quickly, he found himself in love with his sister and started the long train of quite literally pumping out kids. Within a few years, Mithridates had captured Trapezos, a rich coastal town with a massive port. Mithridates then sought out after Armenia Minor, and by marrying his daughter Cleopatra to Tigranes the Great, he had sealed an alliance with Armenia, and for it, he gained Armenia Minor. After this, he went into the region of Colchis. After a few days of fighting, he captured it. Brave soldiers lived in this area, and they would be very useful at this. At this point, not much happened. Mithridates strengthened his, strengthened his army and began to build massive, well-fortified castles with secret passages, and he stuffed these with excess gold that would be used during the Third Mithridatic War. After a few years of relaxing, he started to miss out on his old life, so to quote-unquote get some exercise, Mithridates once again went on a journey, leaving behind his kingdom. He visited many towns in different lands, pointing out what could be used to their advantage. After about a year of this, he returned home, and to his horror, his sister-slash-wife was plotting to kill him. She had an affair, and couldn't allow Mithridates to live. Enraged, Mithridates immediately had her killed. No one would escape the king. At this point, the Greeks and the Bosphorus were trying to gain freedom from the Scythians. Mithridates sent Diophantus to do what was needed. The Greeks were elated to see Pontus helping, and quickly they joined in the army. Diophantus took to Scythia. Fighting battle after battle, he was finally victorious. This would only last for a while. As soon as Diophantus went back to Pontus, the Scythians rebelled. Diophantus was sent back, and quickly he beat them into submission. They began paying tribute and sending troops. On the western side of the Black Sea, Mithridates used very few military tactics and mainly practices dis diplomacy. This worked like a trick. He was the sole ruler of the Black Sea. Now all that was left was Galatia, Cappadocia, Paphlagonia, and Bithynia. Nicomedes and Mithridates took Paph Paphlagonia, but Rome intervened. Mithrid Mithridates obliged, and so did Nicomedes. However, once again, Mithridates was mad. He was the ruler of Paphlagonia, and the Romans took it from him. He would not sit, sit by. Moving south, he attacked Cappadocia. What should have been a bloodless was about to turn to war. As the armies marched onto the plain, Mithridates invited the ruler of Cappadocia for peace talks. As soon as they started to walk away from the army, Mithridates swirled back and cut the ruler's throat with a dagger. Everyone was in shock. The Cappadocian army quite literally walked off the field. Mithridates was the ruler of Cappadocia. However, that would not stay. Rome sent Sulla to suppress the situation, which he did. Once again, Mithridates was not going to allow this. He called over Tigranes the Great to take over Cappadocia, which he did. Rome sent Aquilius to fix the situation again. Now at this point, Mithridates learned that Nicomedes III has died, and his son Nicomedes IV, a weak tyrant, came to power. Mithridates almost took over Bithynia, but Aquilius didn't allow it. Realizing he was angering Rome, Mithridates stepped back and allowed everything to calm down. However, Nicomedes had borrowed hordes of money from Rome, and now was poor, and couldn't repay it. Aquilius saw this as a time to get rich. Aquilius told Nicomedes to raid Pontus, something that would start a never-ending war. Aquilius thought that these raids would teach the quote-unquote arrogant minor king Mithridates a lesson. Nicomedes walked around Pontus like it was a candy store. Where were the local garrisons? This eerie silence could not bode well. Mithridates had his horde of troops ready. He was holding them back. This was his trap. He allowed them to raid him as he waited for the right moment. After the raiding, Mithridates made his case in Rome, sending Pelopidas. After going back and forth with the Romans, Pelopidas announces, Bear in mind this, Romans. My king Mithridates rules his ancestral domain of Pontus. He also rules many neighboring lands, the Colchilians, a very warlike people. All the Greeks around the Black Sea, too, have joined Mithridates. Mithridates has his allies awaiting every order. Scythians, Taurians, Bastarnae, Thracians, Sarmatians, and all the tribes of the Don, Danube, and the Sea of Azov. King Tigranes Armenia of Armenia is Mithridates' ally, and the Parthians will join, too. My king has already built a large number of warships and is building more as we speak. The pirates have also joined our side. Then, Pelopidas raised a chilling image. Your newly acquired provinces of Asia, Greece, Africa, and Italy will revolt and join our side. 
Your Italian colonies are raging war on you due to your endless greed. Come now, choose! Pelopidas raised his voice. Restrain Nicomedes from harming Pontus. If you do this, Mithridates will help you put down the rebels in Italy. Now then, Pelopidas exclaimed, Throw off the deceitful mask of friendship, or let us go to Rome and settle the dispute there. Aquilius was goaded in. He forcefully brought Pelopidas back to Pontus. Nicomedes would lead the invasion force with 56,000 troops. Aquilius would follow with another 40,000. Another 40,000 would march through Galatia under Cassius. Opius held another 40,000 in Cappadocia. Mithridates himself had an army of 190,000 infantry, 10,000 cavalry. He also fielded a few hundred scythe chariots. He was more than re ready for the greedy gluts. At the head of this horde of troops were the deadly scythe chariots, followed with a massing of cavalry from every place you can think of, Galatian, Cappadocian lancers, Armenians, and most importantly, the deadly Scythians. After this came the infantry. They were Hublitae style phalanxes. Phalangites followed. They were the core of the army. Many different types of skirmishers, peltists, archers, slingers, all of these troops were decorated with almost every pretty gem you can imagine. How Mithridates got all these jewels is impossible to know. The Crimea is one spot. This horde of troops was followed up with many different barbarian units. We would be here all day if I named them. At this point, Mithridates' spies reported Nicomedes moving in. Mithridates, in his mid-40s, had little combat experience, so he sent Archelaus, Neotompolis, Arcathius, Mithridates' son, and Craterus, the chariot commander. In the ranks of these troops were 10,000 brave Armenian cavalry. Following this up was some light infantry and 1-600 to chariots. The battlefield had a rocky hill on the right and the Amnias River on the left. The fight started. Neotompolis rushed the hill, but Nicomedes was ready and pushed him back. Arcathius, Mithridates' brave son, charged the phalanx. A risky move, but it could pay off. Was Arcathius recreating Alexander at Chironea? It is possible. Nonetheless, the charge worked, and Neotompolis regrouped his troops and charged again. Now, Archelaus ran his troops into the fight, slowly giving ground. Now, screeched Archelaus! Craterus, the chariot commander, grinned. Throwing his troops forward, he ripped a hole in the Bithynians. Now, Arcathius charged the rear. It was over. The horrified Bithynians ran for the hills. A moment of triumph filled the air. What a grand victory, the commanders thought. They sent back the prisoners to Mithridates in the war chest along with all the mercenaries. Nicomedes had, however, Mithridates sent everyone home. He was more than rich enough. Is this when Mithridates gained the nickname Eupator, which means good father? It is possible. Aquilius scoffed at Nicomedes, but he fared no better. At the Protopachium fortress, he attempted to cross a river, but Mithridates was too fast and destroyed 10,000 of his troops. Aquilius was doomed. Eventually, Mithridates caught him and killed him by pouring molten gold down his throat. One more drink for the glutton himself. Now, where were the other Roman generals? As soon as Cassius learned that Nicomedes and Aquilius lost, his army deserted him. He ran for Rhodes and made it back to Rome. Now Opius was horrified, because as soon as he got the news, his army deserted him. He ran for Loadicia. At this point, Mithridates owned everything he wanted. Everyone in Asia hailed him as the sole leader of the Light vs. Dark War. Opius was eventually captured. He would stay with Mithridates and serve him. Everything went right into Mithridates' hands. Asia was his. With troops from all corners of the world joining him, he ordered his pirates to unleash hell in the Aegean. And that they did. His 300 warships followed too. Now at this point, Mithridates began his speech. It is quite long, so I will only add in what is important. I am confident of victory. You know as well as I do, the Romans can be beaten. We have already beat Aquilius and Nicomedes, and driven the Romans out of Asia. The Romans are not invincible. The Samnites, Pyrrhus of Epiros, and Hannibal Barca have all beaten them. The Romans, continued Mithridates, have enemies everywhere. In Anatolia, they have hammered deep hatred into the people due to their own greed. The Gauls, famed for their spirit and valor, have invaded Italy before, and we can count on them as allies. Mithridates', Mithridates intelligence sources were formidable, and here he shows it with this next paragraph. At this very moment, all of Italy has risen up in war, following the lead of the Marsi and the Samnites. These people are demanding independence. Rome is also torn by internal strife among its leading men. This conflict is just as bloody as war with the Italians, and much more dangerous for Rome's survival. Like I said before, this speech is long, and I'm going to end it here. Just due to how long it is, at this point, no one could stop King Mithridates the Great. He owned all of Asia in vast hordes of money and troops and warships. 
He then, for loyalty of Asia, wouldn't tax them for five years and cancelled all their debts. Mithridates now started the administration, changing all Rome had did. Mithridates now needed to get Rhodes out of the picture. Their towns were rich and their ships were the best in the sea. He ordered his 300 warships to sail towards Rhodes. The Rhodians, who only had a few, attempted a brave sally. Mithridates ordered his ships to surround the Rhodians. However, they were too smart and fled back into their port. Mithridates intended to outdo Demetrius Polyarchites, who had failed over 200 years ago. Mithridates began the assault. His engineers constructed a massive Sambuca, essentially a huge tower standing on two ships with artillery on top. The Rhodians burned the outskirts of their town. While Mithridates camped in the now burned outskirts, he ordered his ships to probe the harbor. The next day, the Rhodians sallied out and attacked. Mithridates ordered his ships into the fray. They fought, fought bravely, but they were no match for the veteran defenders. The next day, the Rhodians sent six ships to look for one of theirs that got lost. Mithridates pursued all day, with 25 of his own. Eventually, dusk came. Mithridates ordered his ships back to the island. However, this is what the Rhodians waited for. They turned and attacked Mithridates. In the chaos, as Mithridates commanded his ships, one of his allied ships from Chios rammed into his own. Somehow he survived, but lost two ships to the defenders. At night, while lying in bed, Mithridates' paranoia rose. Was the Cayenne ship hitting me an accident, or was it on purpose? He would find a way to get even. After a few days of random probes, Mithridates planned one final assault. It was time for the Sambuca to be brought up. The massive tower horrified the defenders. The Pontic troops climbed the tower, but all of a sudden the Rhodians cheered. It was collapsing. The tower was too big, and eventually it fell into the sea. Mithridates gave up. He sailed back to Asia and mopped up a few towns on the coast of Lycia. Mithridates now did something that would echo in history. Sending messengers out, he called upon all towns of Asia. It was time for the Asiatic Vespers. How in the hell Mithridates kept this a secret between everyone is a complete mystery. It's insane to think that he did this. How everybody has tried to figure it out, and no one can, and neither can I. Many think that he tied messages into horses' hair, or even in women's or men's. Maybe he had underground tunnels? It's possible, but once again it's unknown. Maybe he was birds or animals, but that's very unlikely. But it is possible. Nonetheless, however, it began. Terror set out across Asia. No Roman could hide. In the end of this blood-soaked event, 80 to 150,000 Romans died. Everyone was amazed and confused on what would happen next. Mithridates, by doing this, brought all of Asia into war with the Romans. The only Romans that managed to escape were hiding in Chios. Mithridates now hated the Chians. Now it was time Mithridates sent messengers to Greece. Aristion, the leader in Athens, and when Mithridates' messengers arrived, they were celebrated. Now Mith Mithridates planned a three-pronged attack. Archelaus and Metrophanes attacked Delos, and all the slaves joined the army. 20,000 more Romans were killed. The number for dead Romans was now 100,000 or even more. Archelaus went to Athens, Metrophanes went to Euboea, and Arcathius and Taxiles went through Byzantium with 100,000 soldiers, 10,000 cavalry, and 100 to 150 scythe chariots. Now Neoptolemus and Dromatikes were gathering more troops. Dorylaus, Mithridates' best friend, was in Asia with another 80,000 soldiers. Only a small Roman garrison was in Macedon, and they were pinned by all the armies. The Roman garrison went down to Boeotia to clash with Archelaus, and they did so for three days. After this, Sulla arrived and ordered him back to Macedon. Archelaus, not having anything more than 10,000 troops, mainly Galatians, retreated back to Athens and stood in Piraeus. I'm not going to go into detail about the siege, because I have a video covering it, the whole siege. But to shorten things up, the two sides fought for a year and hammered each other. Both sides showed skill and amazing strategy. However, in the end, Piraeus and Athens fell. Sulla wasted hundreds, if not thousands, of lives in these sieges, and had nothing to show for it but a burned town and port. Eventually, and sadly, Mithridates' son, Arcathius, fell ill and died. But he died a glorious life. He was nothing but faithful to his father. When Mithridates got the news, he fell into a deep depression and never came out of his court for multiple days. Back in Greece, Archelaus met up with Taxiles in the Bronze Shields. That was the name of the army, not to be confused with the pikemen. Archelaus attempted to fight Sulla, but he wouldn't take the bait. After a few days, a shepherd led Sulla behind Archelaus. 
Sulla agreed to ambush the massive horde of Archelaus was a wise tactician, and camping in Caranea was a good idea. Of course, he didn't plan to fight here, but as soon he would have to. Before this battle starts, I want to explain the number of different cultures in this army. Roman slaves starting out, along with Greeks, Thracians, Macedonians, Bastarnae, Sarmatians, Scythians, Taurians, Moetians, Colchians, Henicoi, Albanoi, Iberiae. There were Pontians, Bithynians, Phrygians, Paphlagonians, Cappadocians, Chaldeans, Cilicians, Galatians, Turret Folk, Chalibians, Tarbani, Armenians, Medes, and Syrians. Some of these guys brought freaking camels from Bactria, all with strange armor, gems, gold, silver rings, and necklaces. Some of them had tattoos. Nonetheless, the ambush worked. All of a sudden, rocks came boiling down. Many were killed. Archelaus rallied some cavalry and sent them off to hold off Sulla. Eventually, the lines were drawn. Archelaus sent forward the scythe chariots, but the Romans were trained for this. All they did was step out of the way and then kill the chariot drivers. The Romans charged. The barbarians locked their shields together and held strong. The Romans were amazed to see slaves fighting so hard, but these slaves wanted freedom. They would stop at nothing to win the day. Fierce melee combat raged as both sides fought to prove themselves. At this point, it was once again Taxiles and Archelaus proving themselves. In the chaos, Taxiles brought up his brazen shields and attacked the Roman right. Archelaus rallied the rest of the cavalry and in the famous wedge formation, formation carved a path through the Roman infantry with wild success. The barbarians, fighting wildly with their commanders at their side, gave the Romans one hell of a round. Eventually though, both wings broke and only 10,000 Pontic troops made it out alive. A hundred thousand troops were gone. What was going to happen now? Well, my boy Mithridates wasn't given up easy. He snapped out of his depression and ordered Dorylaus into Greece. In Greece, Sulla was ravaging the place like a wolf. Archelaus did the same though. Mithridates began assembling another army back in Asia. Dorylaus eventually arrived. But before we continue, let's see what was going back in Rome. In Rome itself, Marius and his allies were attacking Sulla's party, like quite literally attacking them with gangs. It was insanity. Rome sent Flaccus into Greece to replace Sulla. He wasn't important now, we will see him later. Archelaus now had 90 well-trained troops. Now Mithridates' thought process wasn't stupid, it was smart. He had to keep Sulla in Greece. The Asian towns were not loyal. Yes, they loved Mithridates, but they weren't going to give their lives for this war. So keep the Romans in Greece, keep the towns loyal. It's a smart move. Now back to Greece. Sulla and Archelaus would meet at Orchomenus. Sulla, seeing how much cavalry they had, started to build trenches. Dorylaus and Archelaus responded by surging out of their gates and attacking the Roman troops. They were horrified by the sight of the Scythian Sarmatian horsemen. The Romans fled. The cavalry pressed them into their camp, and it looked as if victory would go to Pontus. However, Sulla quickly grabbed a standard and rushed into the fray, screaming to his fleeing troops, Orchomenus, remember the name. I am prepared to fight and die here. When people ask you where you turned and left your general, tell them about Orchomenus. This was the move that changed the fight. The Pontic cavalry fought bravely, and at this point Archelaus' son died fighting for his father. The barbarian archers were forced into drawing out their arrows and using them as a melee weapon. Both forces brought out everything. Fighting started again. This time Archelaus sent the chariots charging into the enemy, but the Romans had laid down stakes and sent the chariots reeling into their own infantry. Sulla attacked, but was stopped by the horde of cavalry. Both sides retired for the day. Dorylaus and Archelaus were astounded. They had lost 15,000 soldiers on the first day. Now the second day came, and Sulla was besieging the camp. Archelaus announced, How dare the Romans have the audacity to besiege us when outnumbered 2 to 1. Now get out there and fight. The Pontic troops, almost acting if they were fearless, attacked the Romans outside of their camp. All hell broke loose, and the Pontic troops fled back into their camp. Sulla broke down a section of the wall. Nothing happened. No one moved. It was as if the earth stood still. A Roman soldier jumps forward and kills another in front of him. Fierce combat rages. Eventually, after fighting shoulder to shoulder, the Pontic army was destroyed. Another huge loss. Everyone was thought to be dead. But after two days, Archelaus and Dorylaus emerged from the swamp. They had barely survived and fled to Euboea. Amazed, Mithridates now had to face multiple threats. Rebellion surged across Asia. He sent a few generals who kindly played the citizen with blood. In Chios, which was one of the towns that revolted, Mithridates had everyone killed and enslaved for helping the Romans. Now back to Flaccus. He had actually been killed by Fimbria due to the fact that he was quite literally an idiot. 
Framir was now in Asia. Mithridates gathered some cavalry and sent his son, also named Mithridates, to skirmish with Fimbria. It ended badly. He had lost 6,000 cavalry. Archelaus began peace talks in Greece with Sulla. Both Sulla and Archelaus went back and forth, and Sulla wanted Mithridates to go back to what he owned before the war, but Mithridates wanted to keep all Asia. Sulla, in rage, shouting, What? Mithridates had, has been in Pergamon this whole time? He's lucky I don't chop off his right hand with which he signed the death warrant for so many Romans. He'll sing a different tune when I walk into Asia. Archelaus intervened and calmed Sulla down. Many think Archelaus was turning to the Roman side at this point, and others say he actually threw the battles in Greece. Mithridates fled from Pergamon to Pine TNA, and Flaccus pursued, and then besieged the town. Would Mithridates finally be caught? As if on cue, Lucullus showed up with his fleet. Flaccus thought it would be over. He sent messengers to Lucullus. However, the Pontic king had a trick up his sleeve. He sent his own messengers to Lucullus, stating that he had to get to Sulla to sign the peace treaty. Lucullus was loyal to Sulla, and he allowed Mithridates to escape. Can you imagine the smirk on Mithridates' face? He pulled a move that he would be famous for. At Dardanus, Sulla and Mithridates met. Mith Mithridates wanted to show that he was not done fighting. He brought 200 warships, 20,000 infantry, and 6,000 cavalry, and hundreds of scythe chariots. But secretly, Mithridates still had 80,000 soldiers. The peace was this. Mithridates would give up 70 ships, 500 archers, pay 2,000 2, talents of silver, which was nothing to how rich Mithridates was. And all of Asia and Opius would go back to status quo before the war. Sulla finished up by killing Fimbria and leaving Asia and going back to Rome. In Asia, he left Morena to govern the province. What happened next was a horrible scene. Morena basically raped the place. Every cent he could get his hands on, he did, or he killed or tor and tortured the citizens. Mithridates had essentially saved the place for a few years, but he couldn't save them now. This shows the true colors of the Romans, raping the Asians for choosing the side of Mithridates, the bringer of light against the dark Romans. At this point, Mithridates' holdings in Colchis rebelled. Mithridates sent his army and fixed the situation. Mithridates was far from beaten, and many say that he was just getting started with the Romans. And he was. Like I said before, Morena was the governor of Asia, and when Archelaus defected the, to the Romans, he fueled the flames for the Second Mithridatic War. Morenid wanted the peace to affect Mithridates more than it did, but as you saw before, that didn't happen. So like the eel that Morena was, he began raiding Pontus. Mithridates basically laughed. He sent a few messengers back to Rome, but no one responded. He began to reform his army. He took out the pikemen and brought in imitation legionaries, more flexible and better in combat. He also added more skirmishers and archers, and he made a personal decision to fight in the front lines. He sent Gordius to the Hales River and skirmished with Morena. Mithridates showed up, and let's just say the two legions under Morena's control were completely annihilated. For this victory, Mithridates took almost half of Cappadocia, and then lit a massive bonfire that burned for multiple days. At this point, Mithridates just sat back and enjoyed life. Let's just... let's talk about some things about Mithridates. He was called the master of languages, due to the fact that he knew over 20. All of these were of his ruled subjects. He held multiple parties and basically just lived like a king, nothing to worry about. He did fail to capture some land from the Achaeans and the Caucasus Mountains. Rome's once again sent another messenger to Mithridates telling him to leave Cappadocia. But once again, as soon as Mithridates left Cappadocia, he asked Tigranes, the king of kings, to attack. And he did. Once again, as soon as Tigranes did this, Mithridates sent messengers gold, and troops to Sertorius, the rebel general in Spain, who was kicking arse against the Romans. Sertorius had the same views that Mithridates did. The Romans were just insanely greedy and wanted everything, so Sertorius rebelled and took over Spain. He deserves his own video, so we will stop there. Nicomedes had died, and he made Rome the heir to his kingdom. Mithridates couldn't allow Rome to gain more power in Asia, and so as soon as Nicomedes died, he advanced into Bithynia. In 74 BC, Mithridates' general lineup was impressive. He had the Roman generals sent by Sertorius named M. Varius, L. Magius, and a L. Phanius, followed up by the non-Roman generals named Dorylaeus, Gordius, Neotompolis, Diophantes, Taxiles, Hermocrates, Alexander of Paphlagonia, Dionysus the Eunuch, Eumachus, 
Conocorix, who was a Glacian, Metrophanes, and Aristonicus. Now the grounds were set. The war began. Some called this the First World War. Mithridates started the war off with an arousing speech, and I will include all of it due to this time because it's not as long as the other ones. The Romans, he declared, were driven by boundless greed to enslave everyone. Why did the Senate refuse to sign the peace at Dardanus? Because the Romans never intended to give us peace. They intended to break the treaty all along. Now, this phony will of Nicomedes reveals their lust to dominate us. Mithridates continues, The Romans are losing the war with our new allies victorious in Spain. Italy is ravaged by civil strife and slave uprisings because of their wickedness. The Romans have not a single ally and none of their subjects obeys them willingly. Now Mithridates gestured to his three Roman generals. Look, some of Rome's noblest citizens are now at war with their own country and have joined us. After the speech, Mithridates Eupator Dionysus the Great marched into Bithynia. He had 120,000 foot soldiers and 16,000 brave cavalry, along with 100 sized chariots and 400 ships. Cauda and Lucullus were the governors. They planned a two pronged attack on Pontus, but it wouldn't happen. Mithridates was too fast and wiped Cauda's troops out. He killed 5,000 Romans and burned and captured ships. Mithridates now besieged Sisychus, the gateway to Asia. Lucullus only had 30,000 infantry and 2,500 cavalry. Now let's pause for a moment. The reason this is known as the First World War is due to the fact that almost all of the world at that time was present, like quite literally. This world war stretched from Spain all the way to the Caspian Sea. Everyone present at this was fighting for their freedom from the Romans. Mithridates was once again hailed the bringer of light. Now back to Sisychus. The two armies drew up, and as soon as they were going to fight, a freaking falling star slammed into the ground. No one moved. Lucullus and Mithridates stared at each other, and both, without words, walked off the field with their armies. Both generals interpreted this as a good omen, but in reality it was probably a freak accident. Mithridates continued to siege Sisychus. Before the siege even started, the Sisychians began to lose hope. See those campfires they pointed? Those are the great armies of Tigranes coming to help Mithridates. Mithridates, with the advice of Taxiles, blocked the passage of the road. He was ready to take the town. At this exact moment, Mithridates' allied, allies Sertorius died. Mithridates was on his own. What happens now is very conflicted. In fact, no one knows why it happened. But before the town was assaulted at all, Magius, one of the Roman generals, told Mithridates to move his troops away from the passage. Like I said before, why on earth he would do this is unknown. Some say it's because the Fimbrian legions were on the verge of mutiny. It is possible, however, they wouldn't revolt for almost another five years. Whatever the case was, Lucullus now had Mithridates surrounded. The fight began. Mithridates hit Sisychus with everything he had. Battering ramps, catapults, massive siege towers over a hundred cubits high. Attacked the walls, but like the Greeks years earlier held out for a year against Sulla, so did the Sisychians. Nothing broke the brave defenders. Mithridates had another trick. He brought up 3,000 captured Sisychian citizens. In full view of the town, Mithridates tortured them to death. Now Mithridates really attacked. He let down the Sambuca Bridge, the same thing that collapsed at Rhodes. This time, it wasn't going to collapse. And at first it worked, the Sisychians broke. Almost immediately, they recovered and attacked the Pontic troops and beat them back. When this failed, Mithridates tried again and again. Nothing worked. In Apion's own words, he stated, Mithridates left nothing untried within the compass of human energy. But nothing worked. And once again, another rebel rouser rose in Italy, and his name was Spartacus. Mithridates immediately sent for an alliance, which he accepted. And Mithridates was desperate at this point, and in one of the tunnels, a Roman wanted to meet with Mithridates. Maybe things were looking up. However, like he expected, as soon as they saw each other, the Roman rose, raised his sword and attempted to kill Mithridates. However, the king was too quick and barely escaped. This time, Mithridates gave up. A few storms had wrecked everything he had built. He retreated at night. Only 20,000 soldiers escaped alive from the siege. Mithridates' pirates came to the rescue. The leader of the pirates was named Seleucus. No, not the king of the Seleucid Empire. He was dead. Mithridates made it home to Sinope. Barely, though. Mithridates was preparing for Lucullus to come into Pontus, and somehow he had gathered 40,000 troops after losing his army. Lucullus was put through hell to take Pontus. Mithridates' towns were extremely well defended and were fighting like wild men. At the, at the siege of Themistrita, the Romans had dug tunnels, but as soon as they went under the tunnels, 
the dudes defending the town threw beehives at them. Yes, beehives. And then sent forward weasels, foxes, wolves, bear, boars, and bears. Insanity. But hey, it worked. The Romans left the town and continued elsewhere. The two armies met at Kyberia. Now, the picture I'm about to paint is a sad one. After skirmishing for a few days, Mithridates was forced to flee. However, his army thought he was abandoning them. They began to panic, and like a group of heroes, the generals ran out and attempted to calm everyone down. But it was too late. No, nothing could stop the horde of troops. Dorylaeus, Mithridates' best and lifelong friend, was attempting to help. And after he threw on his purple cloak, he was stabbed to death over it. Mithridates ran with 2,000 cavalry and what was left of his generals. Lucullus mopped up Pontus. All of Mithridates' daughters and sons were put to death by his friends so that the Romans couldn't capture them. Now at this point, I'm not going to talk about the Armenian campaign, and that's due to the fact that I have another video on it. I will link it in the description. However, to shorten it up, Lucullus chased Tigranes and Mithridates through the mountains and never caught either of them, and in the end his army mutinied, and with that, Mithridates traveled back into Pontus, and once again, I'm not going to be talking about much about that due to the fact that I have another video on it. Nonetheless, let's just say that Mithridates won a battle, took over his kingdom, attempted peace with Pompey, which failed, and then lost the battle to Pompey and fled into the Caucasus. Now Pontus was occupied, and Armenia became a vassal of Rome. Mithridates fled into the Caucasus mountains with his horse-riding wife, Hypsicratia. Many people say she was just as brave as Mithridates himself, who was now in his 70s. Pompey ended up getting lost in the Caucasus. Which is just hilarious, and I always laugh at it, because his troops started to get bit by snakes, and almost none of them lived. Now, back to Mithridates. Mithridates' insane trip across the Caucasus Mountains is one of both daring and insanity. The mountains had narrow passes so small that only one person could go across at a time. This trip outdid Hannibal's across the Alps. Mithridates was under threat at all times from different tribes. None of them attacked. Why? Once again, it's something we do not know and probably never will. But to say the least, he made it across, barely but alive. He went. He then went into the box forest and killed Macarus, his son who betrayed him. Now at this point, there isn't much to talk about. Mithridates' son Pharnacus rebelled. What on earth happened? No one knows. Many say Mithridates' son let him out alive, and that is possible, but it is unknown. But what is known is that Mithridates had one last plan, and that was to outdo Hannibal and invade Italy. This trip would go through Dacia and through the Alps. Is this actually true? Maybe not. But what would the Romans do when all of a sudden a hundred thousand pissed off extremely brave warriors showed up at the gates of Italy? Nothing. They would be doomed. Now back in Rome, Pompey was celebrating his triumph. He had a life-size gold statue of Mithridates and so much wealth was found that Rome probably drowned in it. As Pompey began to smile, the slave behind him whispered a shivering sentence. Remember, you are mortal. Pompey thought in his head, I know, but is Mithridates? Mithridates' legend lives on today. No one outdid Mithridates VI, Eupator Dionysus the Great. His son, the same one that rebelled, would go on to lead wheeling scythe chariots and a strong cavalry force into Asia, not long after his father's death, and slash or exile. Mithridates of Pergamon would do the same. He was a descendant of Mithridates' family. I want to take a second and look back on at Mithridates and what he did. The antidote for poison was recently available during the 1900s in Rome, Italy. Now two last paragraphs to end it all. For Rome, commented Plutarch, the death of Mithridates was like the destruction of 10,000 men in one foul swoop. Emphasizing the greatness of Mithridates and his ultimate defeat served aggrandize Pompey's own accomplishments. And after four decades of conflict, a certain admiration and awe surrounded the king, who eclipsed all other kings. A noble ruler who had reigned 55 years, who had subdued the barbarians, who took over Asia and Greece, who, redis who redis resisted Rome's greatest commanders, and shrugged off what should have been crushing defeats. A warrior who never gave up but renewed his struggle again and again, and then against all odds had died an old man by his choice in the kingdom of his fathers. Mithridates' life had been a roller coaster of sublime victories and harrowing losses, loyalties corrupted into betrayals, moments of divine happiness and terrible revenge, 
as players both East and West jockey to choose the winning side to make the best investment in a vol volatile market of alliances. The risks Mithridates took were never for mere riches or fame, though those stakes could be high, but for the very survival of his Greco-Persian Anatolian ideals, and for freedom from Roman domination. Indomitable even in defeat marveled Apian, Mithridates left no avenue of attack untried within the human grasp. Pliny praised him as the greatest king of his era. Mithridates was in strategy a general, in bodily prowess a soldier, in hatred to the Romans a Hannibal. He was the greatest king since Alexander the Great declared Cicero.